So in the second episode of pancreatic endocrine function summary, um, we're going to focus on insulin, its structure as a hormone, how its secretion is regulated, and what intracellular process results in its secretion within a beta cell. Okay, we'll start with its structure as a hormone. Insulin consists of one alpha chain of 21 amino acids and one beta chain of 30 amino acids. And the number of amino acids varies slightly between species, although the overall function of insulin is quite consistent between species. And insulin can be used um, from one species, for example, bovine or porcine or human, to treat diabetes in human cats or dogs. Although currently it's a, um, an analogue synthesised via a DNA um, synthetic production. Okay, so we're going to initially start with a proinsulin that is formed in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and basically it has a C-peptide attached which is then secreted as proinsulin into secretory vesicles where proteolytic enzymes cleave off the C-peptide and leave that remaining hormone insulin. Okay, so we're going to talk about the mechanisms that result in increased secretion first of insulin. So if we have a look, okay. Secretion of insulin is increased by high blood glu glucose, um, which is a direct trigger and the main responsible mechanism um, for increased insulin secretion from beta cells within the islets of Langerhans within pancreatic tissue. Okay, so another trigger is blood amino acid. So these are both energy substrates that will be um, produced when you've consumed a meal and need to be taken up by cells um, as energy sources. So when they are in the blood, uh, the body is able to produce insulin to increase uptake into cells out of the bloodstream. Um, an interesting trigger is gastrointestinal hormones, which are secreted in response to consumption of food. Um, whereby the expected rise of blood glucose um, is almost preempted by these hormones as a trigger to result in increased insulin secretion. On top of that, we mustn't forget that there is direct nervous stimulation of pancreatic tissue. So we have our rest and digest nervous uh, component of the autonomic nervous system, which is our parasympathetic system. Um, so parasympathetic stimulation can res directly result in an increased insulin secretion. Uh, we next have our mechanisms for decreased insulin secretion. So sort of con uh, it's just contrasting to the main mechanism for increased secretion, which is a high blood glucose. We've got the main mechanism for <laughs> decreased secretion is low blood glucose, as you might imagine. We also have direct sympathetic adrenergic stimulation of beta cells, which can result um, in inhibition of insulin secretion. Um, in addition... Sympathetic adrenergic stimulation uh, increases glucagon secretion, which results in elevated stomatostatin, which results in decreased insulin secretion again. So if you need to review the interaction of these hormones, um, just if you go to episode one of this series. Okay, let's move on to the beta cell structure and how uh, it results in insulin secretion. So the beta cell, if you remember, is on the inside of the islet of Langerhans and is the main cell responsible, or the only cell responsible for insulin secretion, production and secretion. So if we look at the resting beta cell, you'll notice we have some several gates that are of importance in terms of this uh, main mechanism that we're going to focus on today. So we have the GLUT2 transporter, which is, uh, enables glucose to enter the cell initially. Um, we'll go through that in a minute. We have the ATP-sensitive potassium ion channel, which remains open normally at resting uh, state and normally we see potassium ions freely flowing out of this uh, channel while it's open at resting state. We also have the voltage gated calcium channel which at resting state is in fact closed. Okay so our main trigger uh, for insulin secretion we're going to draw, draw the, I guess, functional process in blue just to distinguish it from resting cell processes. So we have is increased blood glucose, which results in 
glucose being transported to inside the beta cell. Okay, once we have glucose within the cell, it undergoes metabolism to form the um, end byproduct of two pyruvate molecules, but we're not going to go into the um, process here. It's quite a detailed process with many enzymes, um, but we want the main sort of objective there is that we have an increase in production of ATP in that process, so energy. Um, when we produce this increased ATP, um, proportion of ATP to ADP within the cell, this increase in ATP leads to the potassium ion channel being closed. When this occurs, the potassium ions can no longer get out, so they remain within the cell, which means that we see an increase in positive charge within the cell. We lose that um, hyperpolarization of the cell in the resting cell membrane, and we get an action potential. Okay, this results in this depolarization of the cell and opening of the calcium, voltage gated calcium channel. The in, resultant influx of calcium ions down their concentration gradient has two effects. We have the acute phase, okay, which is the resultant release of preformed insulin, and that occurs in the first, say, 10 minutes after detection of blood glucose, and that's the acute phase. We get release of the insulin in these secretory granules via exocytosis um, outside the cell. The second phase is the chronic phase of insulin secretion, which is where there's actually being um, more insulin being formed and actually produced within rough endoplasmic reticulum and it'll be this insulin that is actually released so it'll be completely newly formed insulin that is released within the next hour or so and they're the two it's what we call biphasic secretion of insulin